tell me the story. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the one that made everyone sit up and take notice and got them more funding for a large number of years was when there was a building that was identified by intelligence personnel that became the top priority for the National Security Council. It was the largest building under one roof in the world. And it was high in the Russian tundra near this uh, large body of water. So they thought it might be a manufacturing facility for some type of military craft. And they weren't sure what it was. And everybody wanted to know what was going on inside the building because they had triple death wire fencing. In between all those, they had sentries with dogs, 24-hour uh, site-to-site sentry circle uh, around the property, trains coming in, dumping off raw materials 24-7, food coming in, food service for the people who were working inside the building, and no one knew no, what was going on inside the building. And so someone at the National Security Council meetings knew that they had a, a new psychic program down at Mead and sent the manila folder down to... Um, Fort Meade and they handed it to Joe McMonagall. The first thing they handed him was simply map coordinates. And they said, show us what you see here. And he came up with the building that they were concerned about. And he, and he described the building and they said, okay, you're on target. And then they gave him a picture of that building. And they said, tell us what's going on inside here. Now the guys in the National Security Council and all the intelligence guys who were in the room came to the consensus that <clears throat> um, it was going to be some kind of troop carrier uh, that they could probably transport over to the ocean because it was four or five blocks away from the ocean, but it was short enough to where they could transport something of medium size over to the ocean to get it into the water. Um, but that was their best guess. Joe McMonagall was the only person who came up with the result. He dropped into the building and he started viewing this thing and he viewed it over a number of uh, days and came up with a drawing and an explanation and technical specifications for a brand new submarine. And he said, this is the biggest submarine in the world by far. It's one and a half times bigger than the next biggest sub. This is the brand new classification of Russian sub. And he came up with a number of very unique characteristics for that sub. <clears throat> and he said, it's not a cylinder. It's a cylinder that looks like it's cut in half, spread out, and then a flat part welded on the top and the bottom. And the US engineers looked at that later after he sent it and he said, that's impossible. It'd be crushed at depth. You know, it's highly unlikely, et cetera. But then he added the specifications. It's got a special drive um, propulsion system that I, I don't want to say too much about, uh, but it's also got canted launch tubes, which means it can fire nuclear missiles on the run without having to stop, which could give us about 20 minutes warning that we're gonna lose 1,200 cities. So this is a first strike weapon. And it's, by the way, if you've seen the movie Hunt for Red October, that submarine that they used in that movie was the sub that Joe McMonagall outed. <laughs> he said it's almost two football fields long, it's 75 feet wide, it's seven stories tall. He drew, and he's got a video of this where that he sent up to the National Security Council. He drew a diagram of the sub with its specifications, with its very interesting uh, technical advancements that the United States didn't have on their subs. And he's got the original tape that he, that he submitted to the NSC, and this has been declassified so he can share it now. So this is the tape that he reported up to the NSC before the thing was launched um, and, and proved him correct. But he sent all that up, and Robert Gates was the guy who is collecting all the information for the people disseminating the information for the National Security Council, didn't even let it through. Really? Yeah, because he's like, this came from a psychic. And I'm like, yeah, and he's like, he looked at it, and he like, looked at the report, and he's like, okay, the sub, the, the engineers said the sub can't survive at depth. Um, it's way too big. He's the only guy who thinks it's a sub. It's not, they're not gonna be able to roll this off into the water. There's no water there, and they, it's too big to transport over to the ocean. So he wrote, total fantasy on top of the report and sent it back to Joe at Mead. Joe is not pleased. <laughs> he's a little bit of an attitude and he's a really good operative who's now just been put into this remote viewing thing where he's had some success in. And he's like, I know this is a sub. And so he took that total fantasy remark and he wrote under it, 
he went back into a, a meditation and he looked at the sub again. He looked how far along was it, and he made an estimation of how long it was going to take to launch this thing. And he goes, "Yeah, well, your total fantasy launches in 112 days. Send it back to Robert Gates at me or at uh, the Pentagon." How did that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, Robert Gates has a little bit of an ego. The good news is someone at the National Reconnaissance Office picked up this pissing match, and they were curious. And so they tasked a satellite to do a flyover at 114 days from that date that he said 112 days. And they snapped pictures of the Red October submarine, seven stories high, 75 feet wide, almost two football fields long, canted launch tubes, special propulsion, the whole thing. He nailed it all. Are you serious? Yeah. Two cylinders separated with flat pieces in between, right next to a brand new, in a brand new canal that they built right next to the building in from the sea so they could roll it off into the water. So they built a canal in the four months that he said they were going to launch it in and just dumped it into the, into the canal right next to the building. So... That was interesting. And they were two days into, they had all their hatches wide open because they were loading uh, reactor cores and missiles two days into the process of loading missiles. So he nailed it to the day, including all the specifications. And no one believed him. And it was one of the greatest information gathering operations for any launch of any Russian equipment since and to this day. I would imagine that sparked a lot of interest in remote viewing in Robert Gates. <laughs> in Robert Gates' mind. How so what in in and I'm sure a lot of other minds and organizations. So what what happened after this? So the fringe folks who were starting to investigate remote viewing and sending tasks down to Meade became most of the intelligence agencies in the United States government started overtasking the remote viewers down there. So they got crushed. How many remote viewers were there? Um, there were a bunch. I mean, there were four or five that they, they had as a stable, and then they were trying out other um, individuals, bringing people in, letting people go, because they were like less effective. Um, but it was a constant barrage of life or death situations. Tell us what you can see. Um, these are special operations that are going live. Tell us which way we need to turn. What's going on? Somebody just got kidnapped. We got probably 18 hours before he's dead. Uh, help figure out where he went. Uh, a lot of missing people and missing operators. Uh, to tell us where he is, we'll go get him. And uh, that was that was taxing on a lot of those remote viewers, and they got burned out pretty quick. And so that that's where help from Neuro Institute stepped in to help provide a training program that could give them a faster cool down and a deeper focus on being able to get good information in a quicker time so that they didn't have to spend so much time prepping and meditation to be able to get in and get a good viewing on something. How long are these guys spending in meditation? Um, well, it depends on the viewer, um, but you could do, uh, like in the, in the early days, I think Joe told me he was spending, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to try to figure out a place where he could get to where he could get a, a good bit of information. Um, but in his later years, after he was practiced, and this is why plasticity matters here, where your brain changes in form and function to help you do, like you, you play the piano, and then all of a sudden you get better at playing the piano because your brain just gets used to it, and he says, okay, I need to play the piano better. Shooting baskets, you get that muscle memory, well, that's your brain changing to help you shoot those baskets better and just drain the three. Um, doing crossword puzzles, your brain will change in form and function to help you do the crossword puzzles faster. Well, it turns out remote viewing is the same way. Um, later in his life, uh, when he was doing remote viewing, like for one example, he got a call one night when he was in Las Vegas from the local sheriff who was looking for a missing child. And the mom thought the child was with dad and the dad thought the child was with mom and it's getting dark when they figured out the child is missing and it's in Virginia wilderness and in the county in which um, Joe lived and there's, there's wild animals and it's getting cold at night and the kids may not make it. He got a call in the middle of the night by the sheriff who was like, let's get the psychic on the phone. 
And um, Joe immediately picked up the phone, closed his eyes for like five seconds, and then basically told the sheriff, he goes, send your deputy out this road to this particular location. Have him stop the car, get out of the car, get his compass out. And at 318 degrees on his compass, I want you to walk 1,209 steps. Stop, call the child's name out, and he will respond. And that was like within five, 10 seconds of getting the call and asking, you know, what the details were. And then he gave a reading. And so he goes back to bed thinking, okay, hopefully they're going to find the kid. If they follow his directions, they will. About five minutes later, 10 minutes later, you get the, another call in his hotel room and he's pissed because it's ringing the phone in the middle of the night again. So he gets up, grabs the phone. Hello, Joe. We sent our officer out there to the spot where you said, and he pulled out his compass. And he, but this officer just said he got back from training last week regarding missing children. And he said, the statistics are that kids 10 and under will not walk up a hill when they're lost. But he's looking at his compass reading and it goes directly up a, a steep hill. What do you want us to do? And his answer was immediate. He's like, do what I told you to do, click. <laughs> and so then another five, 10 minutes goes by and he gets another call and he picks up the phone a little softer this time because I think he had a feeling that they found him. He's like, did you find him? And she goes, yes, Joe, thank you very much. Good night. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.